Hey Internet, it's RJ. Welcome back. Thanks for tuning into the show today. Now we've reached the end of August. That means we're going to do another Q&A, back by popular demand. Very simply put, I put a community post out with the old Riddler and then you guys ask questions and hopefully I have answers for them. So on today's episode, we're going to go through the questions. We're going to talk everything about Sapphire Lounges, Amex versus Chase cards. We've got some Bank of America in there. We even touch on points diversification. So if any of those sound interesting to you, then I'll ask you in Jeopardy format, what what is never missing a super informative episode of the show? The answer, of course, pressing the subscribe button so we can get to work. Let's just jump right into it. Of course, I will put the question on screen to give credit to the person asking it. And thank you for everyone who wrote in, of course. So with that being said, starting out, Baby Vilch asks, how successful do you think Sapphire Lounges will be? Oh, that is a good question. Um, so if you guys don't know, you know, Chase is finally teased out. They are launching two, two or three Sapphire Lounges, one in Boston Logan Airport. I've been there before. It's decent, but it's a small airport. One is in like Hong Kong or something. I forget where the third one is going to be. Now, these aren't going to be Sapphire Lounges like fully owned by Chase. They're basically going to be like what I would call private label or white label lounges, whichever term you want to use, where Chase is kind of putting they're branding up, but they're run by the club, I think, which also runs some priority pass lounges. So how successful do I think they're going to be? Uh, like moderately successful. Like I think they'll be above most priority pass lounges, but I still think they're going to be below Centurion. And I really hope they're better than the Capital One lounges they're teasing out. We give the Capital One a bad rap. But you know, it's open to Sapphire card holders. I think Sapphire Reserve gets you in and priority pass. Now because it's run by the club, you know, they, they have experience running lounges, so I'm not worried there. And because Chase's name is on it, you know, front and center in the Sapphire brand, I really think they'll put something extra behind it so it won't be your normal priority pass lounge but do i think it will end up like eclipsing amex centurion lounges no i i don't see that but i see the hierarchy probably being centurion then some really nice priority pass or really nice like admiral's club then sapphire then everything else but Interestingly enough, when they do open, I'm going to try to probably go out and check one out. Even if it's just a trip to like you go, you never leave the airport, you just go check a look and then come back. So that's what I think about Sapphire Lounges. But hey, I hope they prove me wrong. Um, so next question we have is another Chase question. Says, Does the Sapphire Preferred finally outpace the Amex Gold card? This is from T. Lewis. Um, interesting. I have, I have the Amex Gold card. And then, of course, the Sapphire Preferred just got refreshed a few weeks ago, so I'll put that on screen. I'll put both on screen so you can familiarize yourself with them. You know, I'm inclined to say yes. I'm inclined to say yes because the gold is a really good card, but the thing with the gold is, you know, you're prepaying up front the 250 you know, and it's basically for the Uber Cash credit and the dining credit, but, you know, they can get you down to an effective annual fee of $10, and the multipliers are really strong. But the Sapphire Preferred, $95.00. The annual fee goes down to $45 effective annual fee if you use it hotel credit, which is really easy to use. You just have to go through the uh, Chase Travel Portal. They have the grocery multiplier. They have dining. They have travel. Now, yes, they are forcing you through the travel portal and groceries is only online, but I personally don't see online groceries as that big of a gap or that big of a roadblock because, it's because the services become so ubiquitous now over the past few years, so I don't really think that's an issue. Plus, the Sapphire Preferred, as you know, has the power to run the trifecta, and you can bring in the Flex and the Unlimited and the Ink cards as well. So even on a one-to-one -one comparison, if I could only pick one, I would probably go Sapphire Preferred. I would rather pay a lesser annual fee and deal with maybe going through the portal and online groceries than to pay the $250 to kind of remember to work my way through these credits, doled out $10 installments each month, and then, you know, to do that. So I would pick Sapphire Preferred, but I imagine that will be some lively debate down below in the comments section. So feel free to sound off there. Okay, so anyways, next question we have here from Asman Sadiq. Should people diversify points? Does it make sense for low spenders to get into multiple points ecosystems? So, interesting question here, sir. Um, it's kind of two parts. You kind of answer the, answer the question in the second part here. So, generally speaking, you know, diversifying points can be good because you end up protecting yourself from devaluation, right? So what is devaluation? You know, points are worth something today and then, you know, Hilton, Delta, United, whoever, 
they just changed the redemption rates. Now it takes more points to redeem for the same exact economy flight or first class flight or hotel room. That's how your points get devalued. And, you know, we were very concerned about devaluation because during the pandemic and lockdowns, airlines and hotels, they sold off a boatload of points to card issuers at huge discounts just to get some quick cash to stay afloat. So devaluation is a real thing. Um, so it could definitely help to have, have diversified points. Now there's two different ways you could look at it. Do you have, you know, Hilton and Mary? and United and Delta points, or do you have Chase Ultimate Reward points and MX Membership Reward points and diversify that way? I think it's a little bit easier to go Chase and American Express because of transfer partners or the travel portal, then you know, you're know you not really locked into any airline or hotel. You have a lot of different options there. So generally speaking, yeah, I mean, if you're a big spender, then you know diversifying is pretty easy. But to the second part of your point, does it make sense for low spenders to get into multiple points ecosystems? I mean, so for cash back, it doesn't really matter, right? You could have thank you points and UR points, whatever. Cash back is cash back. But if you're trying to do the travel points thing, then you know, if you're a low spender, spender, you know, it gets really hard unless you're looking at common transfer partners, right? So if you take Chase and American Express, the one I know that they have in common is Marriott. So you could have ultimate reward points and MR points, and you can still find a pool, a place to pool them together and be a low spender. That's kind of what I do. I like Marriott. I'm kind of coming around to Hilton, but you could do that if you can find partners in kind. I think that's my answer there, yes, but if you're a low spender, then you know it's it's probably fine to pick one of the car issuers and just work out of that that setup. Um, next question here for Mr. Conti. I wonder if the Bank of America premium rewards travel credit card reimburses for escape lounge access. So funny enough, I, I don't do a ton of research on these questions, admittedly, so when I do these, I kind of just go off the off the phone here. But I did have to look this one up because when you said escape lounge, I thought you meant like escape room, you know, one of those, those cool rooms where you try to, you know, do puzzles or whatever to escape. But escape lounge is actually an airport lounge. And yes, I think they would cover this. I mean, it's specifically in their um, in the card description. It says, you know, what that credit covers. It says airport lounge access. So I think it should be fine for that. But yeah, I don't I don't see why not. And if nothing else, um, keep your receipt. And if they don't cover it, then, you know, I think you go in through secured message and say, hey, look, this is clearly an airport lounge. You know, why didn't this work? And usually they'll help you out, maybe make a one-time exception, and then you know for the future. Um, all right, we've got a few more here. So Colin Stearns. So I think to sum that one up, what we're saying is, hey, everyone really talks about trifectas because card companies, of course, they all want you to have all of their products. So the Chase Trifecta, the Amex Trifecta, City has their own now between Premier, Double, and Custom Cash, right? You name it. And those setups are really easy to run. You just get all the cards from them and they work pretty well together. So I think what we're saying is, hey, what's the value or how does it actually work having multiple cards from multiple issuers? Well, first of all, I think this goes back to the first question we had about, you know, diversification in points. Cross setups, you know, I kind of have a cross setup myself. I'm heavy chase. For those of you who watch the show a lot, I have the Superfecta as well, all the cards you listed, plus the OG Freedom card. And then I have the Amex Platinum card. Now, I know we're kind of mad at the Platinum card right now, but I have the Platinum card strictly for the benefits, the travel benefits and things like that. I've done videos on the Clear membership credit. I've done videos on the digital entertainment credit. I'll link those down below. Um, but mainly the travel credits, the Hilton Gold, the Priority Pass, um, the Amex and the Delta lounges, things like that. And I don't really even spend on my Delta or my um, Amex Platinum card, like hardly ever. The thing still looks pristine. So you can see cross setups for that reason. Chase is my workhorse to earn points. And then I like this card because it provides a certain benefit. Um, so I think that's why you see cross setups. A lot of times when people do what's in their wallet, they might have the cards for different things. I know there's people who keep their Amex cards because they like the return protections or the purchase protections that they give. You know, Sapphire Reserve, again, would be, I don't use it that much, but if you ever want to do a car rental, I mean, you know, primary CDW, that could pay for itself if you do enough car rentals, even though you're not physically using the card. So there are other reasons, I think, to have cards besides just points valuations again. So overall, to sum that one up, I think it's a really good question. I tend to tell people, just build out the setup that works for you, right? You know, don't get caught up too much in the folks who are posting, you know, those those once in a lifetime trips where they're in first class and going to do a bunch of crazy stuff. If that's not you, if it's you, then fine, build out that setup. So as long as you know, you can redeem those thank you points from the premiere and then you can, you know, use the chase setup as well. I think that's fine. So those are kind of my thoughts on there. I hope that helped answer your question. 
But with that, we move to the last few questions of the day. Mr. Jeremy Moore, big fan of the show, big follower, so shout out to you, sir. And you've got a few here. So what do you think about the credit card sign-up bonuses and bank bonuses? Do you think that now the economy is picking up, these bonuses are going to dwindle or go away? So we'll pause there and do that question, and we'll come back to it. So kind of, sort of. Um, I think it might be less of the function of the the pandemic and the lockdown, but more of a function of what happened during that. People stopped spending. There's uncertainty. You don't know. You don't want to spend. And people started paying down a ton of debt. Credit card debt is down a lot. So with that said, I think a lot of these sign-up bonuses have been let's get cards back in people's hands and let's get them spending, right? We've seen unprecedented um, offers and things like that going around right and left. So do I think it will slow down? I think there's probably one push left um, this year. You know, right before the holiday season, I will keep your eye out through mid-September, um, you know, for a final round of like amazing offers, perhaps. And then it'll probably slow down until late Q1 or Q2 of next year. But again, I think they just want to get people spending. Now, the bank bonuses, on the other hand, no, I don't think they'll slow down because banks always want new accounts, right? When you, when a bank says, hey, I'll give you $200 for opening an account, moving your direct deposit over here, and they're really not giving up much money considering how much money they ask from us, and you usually have to keep the money there for like 60, 90 days, and a bank is going to make much more than two, $300 on my $4,000 um, in those 90 days. So I don't think those will go away. Now, next question here. How do you keep track of what cards to use and what you use each month? How many credit cards do you have and what is your next personal and business credit card you're going to get? All right. Um, how do I keep track? Well, I don't really have many cards. So let's start with that. The if people would probably think I'd have more cards. That's why I don't say I have a ton. I kind of just know that, you know, um, Freedom Flex right now is for groceries because that's coming to an end soon for me on that sign up bonus. Ink Cash is for gas. I don't carry the Ink Unlimited with me. Um, Freedom Unlimited is for my catch all. I've had that card since I think 2016. So I guess it's just kind of old habit and I don't change my setup too much. So I kind of just remember. But for folks, I, I recommend, honestly, just getting a label maker and just putting it on the card exactly what it's for. If you have that many or every month going through your cards or at least every quarter, you know, a lot of us will do the what's in my wallet each quarter. Then make it a habit, right? Because most category cards change quarterly. So make it a habit. Go through your wallet and say, what am I using and then really only carry the cards you actually need because that's going to avoid confusion as well. Um, now, last question to close it out on. Next cards on my list. Um, well, I'm still 424 right now, so it'll probably be a Chase card. I really want the Ink uh, Ink Preferred card. They have a in-branch sign-up bonus where you go into a business manager. You can get like 160,000 ultimate reward points if you spend like 50K in six months. Now, I don't really have the need to spend $50,000 in six months, and I'm glad I don't, of course. But I, it's funny. I talked to John from Bank Account Bonus Central, friend of the channel, probably too much. But I'm always trying to talk him into pulling the trigger on that one. I want that card. I want to be able to go after that. You can still get 100,000 100, points for 15,000 in spend, so which is more reasonable. I mean, I just got to time it for like if I have like some renovations on like a property or something right now. So no cards on their immediate horizon, but that's where I would go if I needed another car. That's my option. So anyways, guys, those are your questions answered. I hope I provided some additional insights for you. If you did not get the answer you wanted or a thorough enough answer, you have follow-ups, please feel free to comment down below or just respond back to the post and I will go in more depth with you on the side if you want. But but anyways, guys, that's going to do it for this one. If you liked it, drop me a thumbs up down below. If you found it particularly interesting, consider subscribing to the show. We're posting content just like this every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Of course, on Sundays, we have a recap episode. There's all the news you can use in the week that wasn't credit and finance. And at the end of every month now, I think we're going to have a Q&A. You guys seem to show out for these, and I really appreciate it. So thank you so much for writing in. I won't give you a parting question today because I already asked you some questions. So I'll just say thank you so much for watching, and I'll talk to you in the next one.